In the year 2013, I will be 26 years old. My little sister Bjarta will be 23, just like many of your own children or grandchildren. That is a great age we have been told, when you have built your life ahead of you. But I'm not so sure it will be that great for us. I was fortunate to be born in the time and place where everyone told us to dream big. I could become whatever I wanted to, I could live wherever I wanted to. People like me had everything we needed and more, things our grandparents could not even dream of. We had everything we could ever wish for, and yet, now we may have nothing. Now we probably don't even have a future anymore. Because that future was sold so that a small number of people could make unimaginable amounts of money. It was stolen from us every time you said that the sky was the limit and that you only lived once. You lied to us. You gave us false hope. You told us that the future was something to look forward to. And the saddest thing is that most children are not even aware of the fate that awaits us. We will not understand it until it's too late. And yet, we are the lucky ones. Those who will be affected the hardest are already suffering the consequences, but their voices are not heard. Around the year 2030, 10 years, 252 days, and 10, 10 hours away from now, we will be in a position where we set off an irreversible chain reaction beyond the human control that will most likely lead to the end of our civilization as we know it. That is unless in that time, permanent and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society have taken place, including a reduction of our CO2 emissions by at least 50%. And please note that these calculations are depending on inventions that have not yet been invented at scale. Inventions that are supposed to clear up the atmosphere of astronomical amounts of carbon dioxide. Furthermore, these calculations do not include unforeseen tipping points and feedback loops, like the extremely powerful methane gas escaping from rapidly thawing Arctic permafrost. Nor do these scientific conclusions, calculations include already locked in warming hidden by toxic air pollution, nor the aspect of equity or climate justice clearly stated throughout the Paris Agreement, which is absolutely necessary to make it work on a global scale. We must also bear in mind that these are just calculations, estimations. That means that these points of no return may occur a bit sooner or later than 2030. No one can know for sure. We can, however, be certain that they will occur approximately in these time frames. Because these calculations are not opinions or wild guesses. These projections are backed up by scientific facts, concluded by all nations through the IPCC. Nearly every single major national scientific body in the, world, in the world unreservedly support the work and findings of the IPCC. Is the microphone really on? Mm -hmm. I've traveled around Europe for hundreds of hours in trains, electric cars and buses, repeating these life-changing words over and over again. But no one seems to be talking about it. And nothing has changed. In fact, the emissions are still rising. When I have been traveling around to speak in different countries, I am always offered help to write about specific climate policies in specific countries. But that is not really necessary, because the basic problem is the same everywhere. And the basic problem is that basically nothing is being done to halt or even slow climate and ecological breakdown, despite all the beautiful words and promises. The UK, however, is very special not only for its mind-blowing historical carbon debt, but also for its current, very creative carbon account. <laughs> achieved a 37% reduction of its territorial CO2 emissions according to Global Carbon Project. And that does sound very impressive. 
but these numbers do not include emissions from aviation, shipping, and those associated with imports and exports. If these numbers are included, the reduction is around 10% since 1990, or an average of 0.4% a year, according to the Tyndall Centre in Manchester. And the main reason for this reduction is not a consequence of climate policies, but rather a 2001 EU directive on air quality that started the UK to close down its very old and extremely dirty coal power plants and replace them with less dirty gas power stations. And switching from one disastrous energy source to a slightly less disastrous one will of course result in a lowering of emissions. But perhaps the most dangerous misconception about the climate crisis is that we have to lower our emissions, because that is far from enough. Our emissions have to stop if we are to stay below the 1.5 or 2 degree warming. The lowering of emissions is of course necessary, but it's only the beginning of a fast process that must be stopped within a couple of decades or less. That rules out most of today's politics. The fact that we are speaking of lowering instead of stopping emissions is perhaps <coughs> the greatest force behind the continuing business as usual. The UK's active current support of new exploitations of fossil fuels, like for example the UK shale gas fracking industry, the expansion of, the expansion of airports, as well as the planning commission for a brand new coal mine, is beyond absurd. Irresponsible behaviour will no doubt be remembered in history as one of the greatest failures of humankind. Yeah. People always tell me and the other millions of school strikers that we should be proud of ourselves for what we have accomplished. But the only thing we really should look at is the emission curve. And I'm sorry, but it's still rising. That curve is the only thing we should look at. Every time we make a decision, we need to ask ourselves, how will that decision impact that curve? We should no longer measure our wealth and success in the curve which shows the economic growth, but in the graph which shows the emissions of greenhouse gases. We should no longer only ask, have we got enough money to go through with this? But also, have we got enough of the carbon budget to spare to go through with this? That should and must become the center of our new economics. Many people say that we don't have any solutions to the climate crisis. And they are right, of course. Because how could we? How do you solve the greatest crisis humanity has ever faced? How do you solve a war? How do you solve going to the moon for the first time? How do you solve inventing new inventions? The climate crisis is both the easiest and the hardest issue we have ever faced easiest because we know what we must do. We must stop the emissions of greenhouse gases. The hardest because our current economics are still totally dependent on burning fossil fuels and thereby destroying the ecosystems in order to create an everlasting economic growth. So exactly how do we solve that, you ask us, the children school striking for the climate? And we say no one knows for sure but we have to stop burning fossil fuels and restore nature and many other things that we may not have quite figured out yet. That's not an answer, you say. So we say we have to start treating this crisis like a crisis, even if we don't have all the solutions and act now. That's still not an answer, you say. Then we start talking about the circular economy, rewilding nature and the need for a just transition. And then you don't understand what we're talking say that all those solutions needed are not known to anyone and therefore we must unite behind the science and find them together along the way. But you do not listen to that because those answers of a solving crisis that most of you don't even fully understand or don't want to understand. You don't listen to the science because you are only interested in solutions that will enable you, enable you to carry on like before, like now. But those answers don't exist anymore because you did not act in time. Avoiding climate breakdown will require cathedral thinking. We must lay the foundation while we may not know exactly how to build the ceiling. Sometimes we just simply have to find a way. 
The moment we decide to fulfill something, we can do anything. And I'm sure that the moment we stop behaving as if we were in an emergency, we can avoid climate and ecological breakdown. Humans are very adaptable. We can still fix this. <coughs> but, but the opportunity to do so will not last for long. We must start today. We have no more excuses. We children are not sacrificing our education and our childhood for you to tell us what you consider is politically possible in the society that you have created. We have not taken to the streets for you to take selfies with us and tell us that you really admire what we do. <laughs> we children are doing this to wake the adults up. We children are doing this for you to put your differences aside and start acting as you would in a crisis. We children are doing this because we want our hopes and dreams back. I hope my microphone was on. I hope you could hear me. Thank you.